Hi guys, welcome back. Today is part three of the Home Gardener's Guide to Fruit Trees with my special guest, my father-in-law, Ted DeYoung, who's a retired pomologist from UC Davis. So today we're going to be talking all about grafting multiple types of fruit or different varieties of the same types of fruit to a tree and kind of how that works and why it goes wrong sometimes. Um, and then secondly, what to do about it when it goes wrong. Also, we're going to be talking about apple trees in particular, and we're also going to be talking about how to prune your fruit tree when it's a bit of a mess. You've received a tree or you moved into a home and it's a hot mess of a fruit tree and how do you prune it and what should you do and what sorts of direction should you go? So let's just get right into that video with Ted. Today we're gonna to be talking all about apple trees and this is a lovely apple tree that we actually maybe even know what kind it is. Hold on, golden delicious. Golden delicious apple tree. We don't know how old it is because it was planted at this person's house before they moved in. So that was at least four years ago. Um, but it's going to give us a beautiful example of lots of things. So Ted, take it away. Is it two different kinds? Oh, it's multiple kinds. It's multiple kinds grafted together. What do you see down there? Did you know that? Because it has three tags. Yeah, the, the pink tag... The pink tag is the rootstock, that's M111. M111 is a intermediate vigor rootstock. So what's a rootstock? There is a different type of plant that's for the root than for the plant that's growing up the top for, in this case, the apples. They get grafted together and now we have our plant. The fact that it's an M111 doesn't mean much to me and that's okay because I trust that the people who grafted these two bits together knew what they were doing. Now, if you're a tree person, you might want to, you know, find the perfect rootstock. For me, it's just good to know that that's the rootstock. And then on the top, we have our other varieties. Let's talk about the pros and cons of grafting multiple varieties of fruit on one tree. They grafted two different varieties, and it looks like they probably had a third variety on here. Quite often the nurseries uh, produce these, what, what they call three-in-one or five-in-one trees. And this is actually a really good example of why that's not a good idea. So the nursery likes to sell them because they're quite expensive. It, it, it is a bit of a hassle to graft that many times, but that's what nurseries do, graft trees, so it's not a big deal for them. But this is an excellent example why this isn't such a good idea, because invariably one of the varieties will be stronger than the others. Mm. And if the homeowner or the owner does not know uh, how to manage them very well, one of the trees one of the uh, scions, we call the variety of scion. A scion is a plant part joined to a rootstock when grafting. One of the scions will be dominant and more or less choke out the rest. And that's exactly what's happened here. This I'm, shoot here, if, they, if this continues to grow and they nurse it along and this one, I'm guessing that these are gonna be different varieties than this. Mm -hmm. But the chances of them ever really doing much are pretty slim, but it'll be kind of fun for, for you to figure it out. Now this guy here, this is another example. Um, my guess, I can't tell exactly, I think the graft unions are here, here, and here, so I, I'm, I'm guessing that this is probably a rootstock, actually. So, what's a rootstock? So, Virtually all of our temperate deciduous fruit trees are grown on a different variety that's selected for root characteristics. And the top, which we call a scion, is, is selected for usually fruit and um, just other vegetative characteristics. Did you know that? To be honest, I didn't know anything about root stocks until I met Ted. In fact, I heard about a rootstock, didn't quite understand what he was talking about, and would see that fruit trees were always painted white on the bottom, and somehow thought that those two things related. But I'll tell you right now, they don't. And if you want to know more about why fruit trees are painted white on their trunks, you can check out that video up here. Um, we answered that in our part one of the Home Gardener's Guide on Fruit Trees, when we answered the five main questions that home gardeners have about fruit trees. Anyways, long story short, a rootstock 
is grafted to the scion and the scion is the part that we want it's the fuji apple or the beautiful rose or the t part of the plant that we're actually looking for and to understand the fact that we have two different plants working together is really important to be able to manage the tree properly so as you see in this tree somebody didn't realize what was going on and they cut off two of the scions that were producing the type of apple that they were going for. So we need to know what's happening with our tree to be able to care for it the best. So I hope this is helpful for you. It's definitely blowing my mind. So why do fruit trees have root stocks instead of using their own roots? And the reason why we do this for two reasons, it's a way to propagate, uh, a fairly easy way to propagate uh, a particular variety because you want, you want, if you're gonna buy a golden delicious variety, you want it to be the golden delicious variety that has been selected all these years. So you can't then select it through seeds, grow it through seeds, you have to propagate it, veg what we say, vegetatively. And we do that by grafting or budding into rootstocks. The other advantage of that is the rootstock can be selected for uh, disease resistance to the soil conditions or uh, in the case of apple, a lot of them are selected to be semi-dwarfing, whereas the top variety doesn't have to have those same characteristics because they never see the soil. So that's the way almost all uh, temperate deciduous fruit trees are propagated. Guys, did you catch that one? You only propagate fruit trees generally through grafting, not through seed. This was another like revolutionary thought that I didn't know. Because I know you can, you know, plant seeds for tomatoes and strawberries and other things, but not with uh, temperate deciduous fruit trees, the type of fruit trees that lose their leaves. In fact, most fruit trees, even citrus, etc., are use this grafting on rootstock situation because we have this one type of apple or this one type of cherry that we want to keep eating. And in order to do that, we have to graft a piece of the original tree onto a rootstock and that's just been done over and over and over again for hundreds of years. So the next question obviously is how do we even prune this wonky looking tree? Here we have this tree in someone's backyard. You've moved in. This is what you have. It looks kind of a mess. So we want to talk about what should should we leave it alone? Should we prune it? What should we do with it? I have this golden delicious and I don't know what this one here is but let's just pretend it's a good one. Um, First of all, they're planted way too close, but the homeowner can't do anything about that. So here we have, they have to make a decision. Okay, do I want both of these trees or do I want to just capitalize on the, on the bigger one that I have? And I'm going to assume that you want them both. This, this branch here is growing into this tree. That's the very first thing you get rid of. Again, I'm not hurting the tree by doing this. Did you hear Ted say he's not hurting the tree by doing this? That refers back to the part two of the Home Gardener's Guide to Fruit Trees. Again, linked up here where we talk about pruning in a lot of detail and we learn about what pruning does for a tree and how it actually helps the tree and also how to prune trees. So you can check that out. And now with apples, uh, typically we tend to grow, this is again, tradition and a hundred years ago they, ago, they grew apple trees in open vases, big trees, wide trees, like they did peach and, and plum and so on. Open vase pruning style is a way to open up the tree from the center and it ends up with a very wide tree. But nowadays, most apple trees are going to what we call a central leader. And a central leader means that you have one single main central branch and everything else comes off of that. Here's an example of an orchard with central leader style pruning. And that's what I would suggest we do here because you don't have much space. We have a nice central leader and we can do that now. The rule for a central leader though is the, the central leader is the main branch that's gonna continue growing the tr tree upright, right? Whatever is the central leader has to be the highest branch of the tree. In other words, I can't say, well, I kind of like this as a central leader because it's not interfering with that tree, and, but I'll keep this. If I, want, if I want to say, nah, this leader is too close to this tree and, and so on and so forth, 
I want to, I want this one to be the central leader, then I have to come back and cut back here. So you can decide. You can change three. it. One, two, three. So we have a central leader that's pretty clear coming all the way up, but then we have one, two, three. So we're going to pick the one and we're just going to go with that one. You're going to so go with that one. Everything else has to go. Everything else, everything that's going laterally off of that, if it's competing in the same size. Now these, they're not competing, they're small, we can keep them. Okay. Same with that, this and falling and leaning out, that's fine, they're not competing. But these three have the potential to compete. Okay. So the rule for a central leader is, if I kept this one, then this and this has to go. However, because this one is very close to this tree, I'm gonna select this one. Yeah. So in that case, this one has to go, okay? Now we have one, two, three. Right. One, two, three. Basically, okay. these three to choose from. Right. This one has is fruited up and is spurred up and so on. This is more more vigorous. I think I would just go with this one. These it's these it's going to be hard to make this thing grow again. Okay. Well, I could head it here and it might. That would be an option. If I headed it here, this is most likely going to produce a shoot and I can get it out of here. Uh, either way, it doesn't matter. It's not, probably not a bad idea, but you're going into that tree anyway. There's too so much tree happening. There's too much tree here. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say we're going to go with this one. Okay. So because of that, I'm going to cut this off. I'm going to cut these off. And now I'm going to do a heading cut here because I want this thing to go. Yep. This, I want it to be the strongest thing in the tree. So I do a heading Once cut. Once again, we're getting into the details of pruning and on the Home Gardener's Guide Part 2, we talk all about the details of pruning, heading cuts and thinning cuts. I also have a video right here that I'm going to link up on one of these sides. There will be a little eye that comes up um, that I give a quick synopsis of heading cuts and thinning cuts, what the difference is, and when you use each. Basically, with a thinning cut, you're kind of controlling the new growth. With a heading cut, you're chopping off the end of a branch and that's stimulating new growth. The biggest tip that we learned in part two is that pruning a tree actually encourages it to grow. It's counterintuitive, but important to learn about how that works so that you can prune properly. These guys, are just going to grow up and through. So I'm going to get rid of these. Anything that's anything that's strong and up like that, you get rid of. These flatter branches are okay. Because they're going out to the side horizontally. Right. And same thing here. I'm betting, I'm betting that this is the rootstock. It's hard to it's hard to know, but I'm, I'm betting it's the rootstock, so I'm gonna take it out. We don't wanna have rootstock sending up new branches that don't produce fruit, or maybe in the case of a rose, don't produce the flower that we purchased it for. So we need to just be aware of the rootstock versus the scion connection, and this was really helpful for me. So now you have this huge tree left. So now, <laughs> what, what about these, um, Little ones down here. Well, no, I'm gonna, gonna so I'm gonna see to if you get the new out of there mm -hmm. and so on. If that's the case, then that's the case. But this guy here is definitely not gonna produce anything. This is probably another variety. But we're leaving all of these because they're kind of at a. They're, they're flat and they're okay. Okay, that's pretty much as much damage as I want to do here. What about the other? This guy? guy here is dead back to here, so I cut that back. Oh, that whole branch is dead. There, it's green, so it's not dead anymore. Okay, so at this point, we've just had a quick review of pruning. Again, in our part two of the Home Gardener's Guide, we talk about all of this stuff in detail, but basically when pruning, you wanna look for dead, you wanna look for old, you wanna look for crossing branches, and you also want to look for branches that are just shooting straight up in the tree because that causes shade inside the tree and prevents harvest from growing lower down inside of the tree because the sun can't get down there. Again, we go into full detail about this in the Home Gardener's Guide Part 2, all about pruning established fruit trees. Pardon? You don't want the well to take it around. The yeah, same thing. same thing. You, you want to raise it up a little bit or, or 
dig a drainage dish out of the well. The homeowner is asking about the well that the trees are sitting in. So if you look back at that little section, it's kind of sunken around the trees. And that's exactly what fruit trees don't want. It's best to plant your tree one inch above the surrounding soil so that the tree, uh, so that the water drains away from the trunk. Water that pools around a trunk causes diseases and problems for the tree. And so if you can't, like in this situation, there's a well where the trees are sitting in and it would be difficult to, you know, you can't pull them up and mound them higher. You could maybe take some of the soil away from the surrounding area and try and flatten it. You could also, as he was saying, dig a trench so that the water doesn't pool around the trunks of the tree. Now what about this old, this one? Okay, so now apple also keep in mind, so all the prunus species like plums, apricots, cherries, peach, they all produce flowers laterally on last year's growth. In apple, the flower buds are all going to be produced in a cluster at the tip of the shoot not along the shoot, but at the tips of shoots. And so you have to keep that in mind when you prune. You don't want to be cutting all the tips off because that's where your, your flower buds are. Reminder, flowers form the fruit. And you can see here where there was a flower bud at the tip here last year and it produced some of these flowers. These are all little mini fruitlets that dried up. So that's how it produces. So apple is producing differently than, than the prunus. And pears are gonna be the same thing. So you gotta keep that in mind when you're pruning. Whatever you cut, if you cut this shoot off, then you're, you're removing a fair amount of flower buds. You may, you may want that because you may wanna do a little wood renewal, but you, with, with these, I can, I can cut the ends off and I still have lots of flowers back here. But you cut the ends off of these, none of these are going to be flower buds. I'm not confident knowing what to prune. So what should I do? Now, especially if you're a new homeowner and you don't know really what this tree is doing, yes. then I wouldn't do a whole lot of cutting except you look for crossing over and old, old uh, deader branches and so on. But then pay attention, like if it, if it, if it produces a lot of fruit and the trees really, the branches really come down, then you know next year, okay, I can afford to do a little more uh, thinning out of fruit wood because I had way too much fruit wood last year because I had lots and lots of fruit and I didn't thin enough. I ended up with really small apples and I didn't really get anything out of it. Now, if that's not the case, if it doesn't set very much, then you don't want to prune as heavy and you want to be a little more judicious in what you do. So that brings us to the end of this video in which we talked about grafting, we talked about pruning, we talked about apple trees. Hope that was helpful. And we have one more video in this series, Home Gardener's Guide to Fruit Trees, coming out, which will be training your young, brand new planted sapling. If you want to know more about fruit tree science and get into the weeds a little bit more with Ted, I have learned so much from him. And so I'm really happy to promote his new book, which has just been published. And I've linked it in my affiliate links below. You can purchase it on Amazon. It's called Concepts for Understanding Fruit Trees. Thanks for being here, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.